And what I'm going to talk about is what we know about safer disinfection as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic that we're having right now. And let me just start out with this slide. Uh, we have a natural tendency to want to protect ourselves. And right now, this is an unprecedented planet-wide pandemic. We've never done this before. And it's totally natural that people are afraid. And it's totally natural that people want to do whatever it takes to protect themselves. And uh, sometimes that means looking for a silver bullet. Uh, we've got people from the top down who are looking for a silver bullet and sometimes making recommendations that aren't uh, scientifically based and with respect to disinfectants. And by that, I'm referring to our, our president and some of his comments about disinfectants, which you probably have seen on the news by now. So there's a lot of information and misinformation floating around. Uh, the WHO has said that spraying disinfectant in the open doesn't kill the coronavirus. This is not something that they recommend. Um, the, you know, basically spraying everything is not the solution. This is this is uh, from the Times of India. I just liked this particular photo. <coughs> and so, uh, but we have a lot of excellent guidance out there from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, and from our Department of Health, Department of Public Health, here in the city of San Francisco, that we can rely on. And if you haven't looked at the guidance that they have been putting out, I would urge you to do so. There's a lot of very detailed guidance about cleaning as well as many other ways to address the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, this is a public health emergency and we need to follow public health experts. And that's what we do here as well. Um, and anything I say in this presentation, I, I hope there's nothing here that conflicts in any way with what their messaging is. <coughs> but I am going to point out a few things that are sometimes missing from the COVID messaging. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those relates to um, asthma. So you may know that the most common disinfectants that are out there, uh, the quaternary ammonium compounds or quats, and also um, chlorine bleach, are asthmogens. They can cause asthma in someone who has never had asthma before. They can also bring on asthma attacks in people who have asthma. And this is something that really kind of compels us to uh, look at this issue a little closer because right now we're seeing a lot of quats and a lot of bleach being used. And if you look at the CDC guidelines on, on um, pre-existing conditions that can make COVID a bigger risk for you, on that list, are people with asthma, along with all of these other uh, issues. And so we want to really make sure that we're not um, using products in a way that make our risk higher instead of lower, while still acknowledging the fact that disinfectants are critical in this whole fight against the disease. Maybe there are some ways that we can do it more safely. There is also a big equity issue here, and probably you all are aware of this. Um, the, the parts of the city that have the most emergency room visit rates due to asthma are in the southeastern neighborhoods, Bayview, Hunters Point, and Tenderloin, um, places where the, the lower income and people of color are living have a much higher rate of asthma. And there are a lot of reasons for this. But this, this kind of strengthens the case for addressing this, this problem. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I, I want to just talk a little bit about what's really important here in preventing COVID. And this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with people being really nervous about the, their work situation now, and for very good reasons. But it is everywhere. It's not just in city buildings. It is everywhere on the planet at this point. We have to be taking these precautions. 
And at the top of the list from our DPH and also from the CDC are what you see on the screen, washing your hands as often as you can, calling your doctor if you feel sick and, and being very careful about going out in public if you have any suspicion that you are sick or have a fever. Um, avoiding groups, staying six feet away from people, staying farther away from people if you can, just reducing the time you're around others outside the home, wearing a face covering, and avoiding touching your face. These are the big messages that CDC and DPH are putting out there, and you're seeing them everywhere you look right now. And that's still it, interpersonal contact, person-to-person -person spread is thought to be the main mechanism that, by which COVID is spreading among, among us. And they think that there may be, it may be more than we thought before, that there may be some aerosols or tiny droplets remaining in rooms sometimes. Um, so they're finding that this is the number one thing to avoid is person-to-person -person spread. As far as surfaces go, what the CDC says is, we, it, is it may be possible that a person can get it by touching a surface or object and then touching your mouth, nose, or your eyes. But this is not thought to be the main way the virus spreads. So it's important to, I, I'm mentioning all this because it, it points to the fact that just cleaning and disinfection isn't going to solve the problem. It's something we need to do but it's not the, the answer, it's not a silver bullet. So you know, I'll talk just as a reminder, just talk a little bit about what a disinfectant is. And uh, disinfectants, as you all are, are aware, are products that are registered by the US EPA. And um, that means they're registered as pesticides. And being registered as a pesticide means that the EPA regulates what's on the label. This is the legal document that, that governs all of these products. If you see a big label that, like this on a product, it's probably a registered disinfectant. And as you all know, they're not easy to read. And it's very difficult challenge to communicate via a label with tiny type like this. Um, so these are all registered by the EPA and got regulated by the EPA. And it's the EPA that is making the call on which products are um, effective against COVID-19. So if we just think about surfaces a little bit and how viruses on surfaces could allow the virus to spread, you can look at it this way. You, you have an infected human transmitting the virus to the surface, and then that surface transmitting it to another human, and then he, that human getting an infection and the cycle goes on. But let's think about what that means, okay. So when we're talking about a human spreading something to a surface, there are some ways that you can address that. One is to keep the infected people away from the surfaces, keep them isolated. You can reduce the number of places that they need to touch, and you're seeing that at some of the stores around town. Promoting hand washing and sanitizing, and hand washing is the most effective thing, by the way. Sanitizing is for use when we don't have the ability to wash hands. Um, decreasing hand to face contact, wearing a face covering so you're not sneezing onto a surface. So these are some of the things that can be used to lower that part of the picture to make uh, fewer viruses end up on a surface. For, for the viruses that are on the surface, making it to another human, uh, we can reduce the frequency that people need to touch those surfaces in some ways. Um, time is an element here too. Uh, it, hours to days, it, it takes hours or days for the virus to be inactivated and not be um, contagious anymore if it's sitting on a surface. So if it's been sitting there for a week, you're probably safe. UV exposure, if there's ultraviolet rays from the sun, if this is an outdoor surface and the sun is shining on it, 
the, those viruses are going to be inactivated much more quickly. How frequently you clean the surface will have an effect and how effective your disinfection is. This is where you all come in. And finally, um, you know, let's say the virus does make it to another human. There's some other obstacles here. You know, there are, it's generally considered that you're not going to get it from one virus particle. There's a certain critical mass uh, of, of viruses that you need to um, have in your body for you to get the infection. And it varies, and they're not sure how much it is. But, um, you know, our bodies are able to fight things off. So, uh, how many viruses they receive is really important. If that person is hand washing and sanitizing and, and the virus on his hand or her hand does not make it to their face and eyes, then they won't be getting the virus. If they're not touching their face, that will also help protect them. And then of course, there are different susceptibilities from different people. So I'm just breaking this down because it shows you that there are a lot of steps and a lot of things that we can do to reduce the hazard of viruses that are on surfaces. And, and you know, disinfection is what we're mostly talking about today. So this material is stuff you will def you definitely know. Um, custodians are all being trained on this uh, and have been for some time. But cleaning is the number one thing to do. You need to clean surfaces that are dirty before you disinfect them because viruses like other microbes stick to dirt particles. And if you remove the dirt particles, you usually remove the virus. So cleaning, super important. And preferably using uh, cleaning products that are not asthma causing and that are safer. I don't expect people to really read this, this chart, but on the scale of things, what this shows is what's hard to kill and what's easy to kill for all the different you know, microscopic organisms out there, all the different germs that we might encounter. There's a hierarchy. Some things are a whole lot easier to kill than others. So at the top of the scale, things like tuberculosis, that's tough to kill. There, there are special products registered for tuberculosis. Norovirus, which is like stomach flu, a little bit harder to kill, but not as hard as tuberculosis. Athlete's foot, foot fungi, um, E. coli from, um, you know, from fecal material is maybe one of the easier ones to kill. And way down at the bottom of the list are lipid enveloped viruses. And that is what COVID is. Uh, common cold, uh, some of those viruses are also lipid enveloped viruses. So th that's the good news is that almost any general purpose disinfectant should kill the COVID virus. And there's even evidence that soap alone can help kill it. So it's not a matter of needing extra strong products for this particular virus. It is, um, luckily for us, an easy one to kill if we do disinfection properly. Oops, sorry. So how do we know which products to use? Well, we've already heard that you know EOC or CCC has been playing this role of reviewing products and making sure that they are approved by the EPA. Um, and you may never use this tool, but you can know that there is a, what's called the list N by EPA is the list of disinfectants that are approved for COVID. <clears throat> and there's a tool out there that lets you identify them by EPA number. So each, formulated, each formulation of a product has its own EPA number, and um, that is what EPA is reviewed. Um, so one pro problem here is um, it identifies by EPA number, but it doesn't tell you product names because there can be a number of different product names for each EPA number. So it makes it kind of hard to use because if you've ever tried to find an EPA number on a label, it's not easy. And we're looking for the EPA registration number, not EPA establishment number, which is the number to the right of that circle. So uh, 
that makes it harder to identify the approved products. So uh, the, the point here is there is a very large list of COVID-19 approved products. Most of what we were using before COVID anyway is on that list. Most of the products, the, the, the peroxide-based products, for example, <clears throat> are, are pretty much all listed already. Um, the other important aspects to effective disinfection, and you all know this, is that the products, if you're using a concentrate, which we recommend for professional custodians for a lot of different reasons, including cost, but also, um, also environmental impact. You're not carrying water all over the world when you ship the stuff. Uh, it's a whole lot cheaper. It's, um, and they come with dilution systems. So uh, using the automatic dilution system um, is a best practice. And there are even portable ones, as many of you know, that um, uh, make it even easier. Focusing on touch points, the places that need disinfection are the places that people touch, that many people touch. Uh, not, floors and no, not floors and ceilings and walls so much, but keyboards, bathroom areas, do door handles, that sort of thing. You all know this. Applying with a cloth if possible, and this is a general green cleaning principle that if you can apply with a, pro a cloth instead of spraying it into the air, you're gonna be breathing in less of the chemical and in the long term, that is good for your health. And then with disinfectants, leaving that surface wet for the prescribed amount of time, and that is the time that's on the label, that is what is needed to kill those germs. You and and it's really hard to find on the label. But it's usually between five and ten minutes. And uh, people at the library or people who are not trained, you know, some uh, in stores and staff at stores who are using disinfectants may be tempted to spray and wipe, and that's it. And that's really not um, killing germs. Um, having appropriate ventilation and PPE in the areas where you are disinfecting is also very important. And it's important not just to protect you from the vapors of the product, but also from the, the, the viruses themselves. And that's why you're seeing a lot more attention to ventilation right now during the pandemic in general. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Were you making reference to the custodians at the library? Oh, I no, uh, to the, you had mentioned that so there were some staff who are not trained, who are uh, like uh, the one program that you had said uh, where they were using the ready to use product. The, and, the one program you said? Uh, what was it called? Uh, I'm looking at my notes. Yeah, uh, I, I gave you three products. One was called Control 3 of Virex. And then the other one was 282. Yeah. But I thought so you were talking about procedurally. Um, when we talked about when we talked about um, the the need to only put out ready to use products right now from the uh -huh. EOC and the rationale for that, the rationale was that there are likely a lot of untrained people who might be using them and, and not they didn't want them to have to mix a concentrate. And I think you had mentioned uh, that one of the programs at the, at the library where maybe librarians would be okay. disinfecting I, surfaces. Okay, that's what I thought you were talking about. Yes, uh, library staff. Got it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. No problem. <clears throat> so, and, and that, you know, that's not to pick on the library. I'm just saying in general, um, uh, that's, that's one of the reasons that they wanted the RTU. Um, yeah. So is that, then, you know, here, here we get back into green, green purchasing, which cleaning products are safer. And this is where we try to help you all and help OCA identify them. And we usually go for one of these labels that you see here. Um, uh, when I give this talk to residential audiences, it's really all about the first one, safer choice, because that's what you see on the shelves now in stores, looking for safer choice cleaning products. But you won't find these labels on disinfectants. Disinfectants are not 
generally permitted to carry an eco label. So, so then the question is, all right, you have this long list of disinfectants that are approved for COVID. Are any of them safer? And the answer is yes. When it comes to asthma, uh, in, uh, in our opinion, and I think we're in agreement with EPA's Design for Environment program on this, there are certain active ingredients that are inherently safer for the user and for the public. <coughs> and we've listed those here. Um, citric acid, lactic acid, peroxide, which you all know, I know that that's been our predominant disinfectant for city operations, caprylic acid, um, and then um, to a lesser extent, thymol, and I think our custodians uh, kind of veered away from thymol products because of the, uh, the smell, uh, the fragrance, and also uh, there are some, some health impacts associated with, with, with thymol. Uh, however, we keep it on the list because it is widely available for residential users, for consumers. And then alcohol wipes um, for things like keyboards and so forth. And here, uh, our Department of Public Health does not want to widely promote alcohol as a disinfectant because if it's used too much in a space, uh, it, it, is, it is a flammable product. Uh, but using it on wipes on keyboards, that really is your only alternative. So we actually had a report on this, as you may have heard in past meetings a few years ago, reviewing all the um, uh, active ingredients available for disinfectants. And these were some of our conclusions from that report. And so what we've done um, is we took the EPA information on COVID-approved products, and we put a filter on it to filter out the ones that have the safer active ingredients. And, and uh, you can find this on our website, and I've sent this, this uh, link around previously with the invitation. Um, and this is an easy way to find products, and you can sort it out by what we believe are consumer versus wholesale products. You can also sort it out by formulation type and by company and by active ingredient. So this is a tool that we're putting out there to help people focus on the safer products and maybe stay away from the asthmogens if you can get these products. And you'll find product names and there are links to the product information from those product names. You'll see a consumer and wholesale uh, link and that is our take on whether this is only something available from, for example, uh, distributors or cleaning product distributors, or or if you can buy it as individual bottles at the grocery store. The other thing that we provide on here is we've filtered out what the actual dwell time is. So you don't have to look at that label. You don't have to search for it on the label. Uh, we've summarized it here, and this thanks to the EPA. The EPA actually summarized it for us. We put it in here. We've um, we, uh, we flagged any products that are available only as aerosols. Aerosols are something you want to avoid if you can for your own health. And for those of you who are looking for fragrance-free, and this, is, this can be a, a controversial topic, especially now, but we've labeled ones that we've found that are fragrance-free. Um, fragrance is, is controversial because you, you have the psychological element coming in. Um, and uh, the Muni director, who is, whose job I really would not want right now, was very frank in, in pointing out that uh, people, some people are probably looking for a smell that tells them the place has been clean. Uh, they're trying everything they can to get people onto public transit, onto Muni. So he said it may take public theater to lure people back. Uh, literally looking at cleaning products that smell like bleach. So um, uh, it's not an easy job right now. And um, understand that that makes fragrance a little bit more of a controversy. Um, so this is the cleaning products, the COVID cleaning products page that we've set up as a service to the city staff and to our residents. You'll find all this stuff there. Again, that's the link that I sent previously, um, you will find, um, oops, I'm sorry, you will find a fact sheet on there that we've been distributing 
Um, we have some lists of local distributors that we know at last check we're carrying some of these safer products. So that's worth checking if you are looking to buy directly as a department. And we also have a list of products that I showed you previously. Um, I, I also want to point out, and this is kind of a bigger picture, but there are equ other equity components here. Um, as we're talking with city residents about disinfection, bleach is always the cheapest option, and it's also unfortunately one of the more hazardous ones. And sometimes it's literally cheaper than water. Um, and you know, if you don't have a lot of money to throw around on fancy cleaning products, you may end up with bleach. And so. Um, uh, Department of Public Health and the CCC has just um, agreed with us on this and they're putting in some precautions about bleach use in with their guidance on COVID. So that was a small victory we just had on that whole issue. This is our, our uh, fact sheet that we're putting out to the public and small businesses. And so in summary, um, in talking about this issue of disinfecting during COVID, it's really good to put it in perspective that, you know, it is the person to person contact that is the number one way we're going to solve this problem. Uh, we do need to pay attention to cleaning too. It is very important, but it's not the only solution to COVID. The need to clean first before disinfecting, emphasizing touch points, which you all know, and choosing safer disinfectants when you can get them. And and this is where we still have some work to do. Of course, following the directions on dilution and avoiding aerosols when possible. So this is, is the link. Um, and uh, like I said, it was in your previous email, so you should have that already. And now I, I think um, I do want to go back to the discussion now, and I'm going to turn off the recording. Um, so you can speak freely. Hold on just a second. Recording is now stopped. <laughs>